And thank you, Glenna, for leading uh, that song for us. Um, I love to always, always love to hear you play, and uh, and just thank you for doing that. And as we, as I was like preparing for today to lead us in worship, um, I was thinking about how Paul just always says, as Paul says, I've, I've learned to be content whatever my circumstances are, right? Whatever, uh, whether I have, whether I'm in need, um, it doesn't matter. Uh, I've learned the ability to find joy and be content in my savior, in my savior salvation. And today, uh, as we begin to worship, and this first song that we're going to sing um, echoes that, that same idea that, uh, con of contentment, uh, because we know we have a God um, that has done great things. And not only has he done great things uh, in the past, but he's going to continue to do great things uh, because of his faithfulness in the past. Let's pray, and then we'll begin to worship. Lord, we thank you that we have the ability to gather today and to worship you freely. Lord, I, I pray that, uh, that you would be exalted uh, in, in watching your people worship you. Lord, we truly uh, find contentment in the fact that we can come to your feet uh, and we can just uh, be still. And we know that you have done great things in the past and we can be still in front of you because we know that you will do great things in the future. Lord, you are going to continue with your promises that you have made. And so that is why we, we worship with gratitude in our hearts, um, because we believe that. Lord, I pray that you would be blessed uh, by watching your people worship. And it's in, it's in your son's name I pray. Amen.
announcements for you so that you know a few things that are coming up. A reminder to you that today from 1 to 4 p.m. is the drive-through voting on accepting Andy Millis as our youth minister. We encourage all members to make their way here to the church. You'll pull in the drive. There will be people here to direct you where you need to go. Bring your own pen. They have asked that. Bring your own pen. We'll provide the ballots. You'll be handed a ballot, you'll put that in the ballot box, and we'll make sure that we're following all proper social distancing rules, uh, and you'll never get out of your car, you'll just pull right through, and it's as easy as that. Uh, also today is the fifth Sunday, and every fifth Sunday we take up a special offering to help some type of special cause, and this time we will be benefiting the Monts family. Uh, Sharon and Jeremiah Monts just had triplets. And last I heard, everyone was doing well, but with triplets comes a little added expense. So we want to help them out. So if you are able, we would love for you to contribute. You can contribute online uh, at the regular website for giving. There is now a special tab for the fifth Sunday offering, or you can drop that in the mail. Or, oh, I better wait on that one. Uh, there's still youth tonight, by the way. Uh, Edge Youth is meeting through Zoom, so you can still do that. And the thing I was alluding to, uh, if you really want to, you could bring your fifth Sunday offering next Sunday, June the 7th. We are reopening our doors. Uh, so exciting. I know you've been waiting for it. Uh, with that comes some extra responsibility. We still want to make sure we are adhering to uh, the social distancing precautions that are recommended. So please visit our website. There is a list of recommendations and requirements of what we're going to be doing to make sure everybody stays safe and healthy. Uh, so please take the time to read through that and watch the Facebook page because there should be a video popping up soon to give you a little bit of added information there. And now, one of the last times we may have to do this, uh, I want you to get your phone out and I want you to start sending messages of love to other members or just anybody else in general. Let them know that you're thinking about them today.
Son of God hung on a cross. The day was dark and all felt lost. But stirring a heart beneath the sea. And the Lamb of God fighting. Pour out our prayer. 
hearts, they will cry. Got these bones, they will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts, they will cry. Got these bones, they will sing. side of us belongs to you because you are our hope lord you are uh, the thing that keeps us moving day in and day out lord and we owe it all to you because you are a great and worthy god lord we come around the table to sack to remember the sacrifice lord that you have paid for us lord and i pray uh, lord that you are blessed uh, by watching your people not just sing today but lord by the by the the praise that they lift up to you day in and day out. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. In preparation for our celebration of the Lord's Supper and the offering today, I've chosen to read from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Interestingly, the word reconcile in one form or another appears five times in this brief passage. Now, reconcile is basically a relationship word. It implies that a relationship that had been severed has been fully restored. And this, of course, is the life story of every Christian. Before we met Jesus Christ and were saved by him, we were estranged. We were separated. We were alienated from God because of the sins we had committed against him. As the Apostle Paul put it in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But because of God's great love for us and because of his intense desire to have a personal, eternal relationship with us, God acted. Not because he was in the wrong, but because we were. He was not alienated from us, but rather because of our sins, we were alienated from him. But it was God who took the initiative and paid the price to restore that broken relationship. And this is what this memorial supper is all about. That initiative which God took in Christ to reconcile us lost sinners to himself. That initiative, of course, was Jesus' willing, sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. There, as memorialized by Jesus in the bread and the cup, God paid the price in Christ that we might be restored to him. Thank God he took the initiative and paid the price to reconcile us to himself. And what a compelling example this is for us in maintaining our own human relationships. Let's pray. Our blessed Father and God, as we come to the table today, we do so remembering that it was you who took the initiative to restore us to yourself. Thank you, Father. We, were, we will be eternally grateful for what you did for us in Christ and how you brought us to yourself to be your sons and your daughters through him, making us righteous in him. Father, bless these emblems today, the bread and the cup as we partake. May they strengthen us and prepare us for the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.
good morning, New Hope family. I want to take an opportunity to introduce to you John Mitchell. John is the new director of the Christian Restoration Association, having taken over from Lee Mason in January of this year. Prior to that time, John served in churches in Florida, in Kansas, and Virginia, and he began ministering churches after his retirement from the United States Navy in 2003, where he served as a submarine officer. So I think John could give new meaning to going down under, evidently. I've never experienced anything like that, so I'm sure he would have some stories to tell. The Christian Restoration Association has been around for about 100 years. Uh, it, the story really begins with the uh, estate of a Sidney Clark that he left to the Richmond Street Christian Church years ago, and that eventually became the Christian Restoration Association. You're familiar with it, even if you don't recognize the name. For those of you that pick up the Restoration Herald here at the church and read the uniform lessons in it, news of the brotherhood, the teachings of this magazine, it's been around a long time. John is the editor of this now, and you can read his editor's viewpoint in every one of the Herald's from now on. And in this newest issue, he's talking about how the COVID-19 virus has just kind of helped us push a reset button on how we see things, our perspective. But one of the programs of the Christian Restoration Association is the Recycled Riches Program, where they loan out money to churches that are going through building projects or putting up a brand new church someplace, whatever the case might be. And the CRA gratefully approved our request for a building construction loan in the amount of $300,000. You can see up here in front, I hope, uh, some of our leaders as we're trying to practice our social distancing. But John is going to uh, give the check for the $300,000 to our chairman, Jim Schultz, and we ought to be very grateful for the ministry of the CRA. They are worthy of our support. They're saving us well over $90,000 in interest. And so, John, I'm going to let you take care of that, and I'll step aside. Thank you very much, Bill. It is a real privilege to be here this morning, and it's a real honor to give this check, $300,000, over to Jim. I will say that in the process of uh, researching and your loan. It was amazing how much encouraging things we heard from the work you're doing here and the influence to the community. So we know we're supporting a good cause and a good work and we wish you well. We'll continue to pray for you and hope that you'll continue to pray for us. So it was a blessing to partner with you. Thank you very much. You are welcome. We would shake hands, but it's against the rules. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Bill mentioned that I was in the submarine force. I wasn't expecting him to say that. I did, I spent 20 years in the Navy and the submarine force, and then I made what I think was probably an interesting career change from a submarine officer into a preacher. Well, what I wasn't expecting in that transition is most people that I meet, when they find out that I'm retired from the Navy, they assume that I was a chaplain in the Navy, because now I'm a preacher. And so I used to tell them, oh no, I was just a normal submarine officer. I got to thinking about that one day. And I realized that anybody who would volunteer to get in a steel tube, propel it with an operational nuclear reactor, and then sink it on purpose is not normal. So I dropped the normal part, and I just tell people I was a submarine officer. It's one of my favorite things to talk about outside of Christ. My time in the Navy and serving in the submarine force is probably the most enjoyable thing. It's my favorite thing to talk about, but we don't have time for that this morning. The book of Hebrews is a very interesting book. It's one of the most interesting books in the New Testament. One of the things that makes it interesting is it's the only New Testament book that we aren't really sure who wrote it. Now, I hold the position that Paul wrote it, but I wouldn't be dogmatic about it. I wouldn't argue with you about that, and I wouldn't expect you to argue with me. But the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who, for reasons that I really can't understand, were thinking about abandoning Judaism, I'm sorry, abandoning Christianity and going back to Judaism. Now, to you and me today, that just doesn't make any sense, but for some reason they were doing that. 
So the writer of Hebrews, and if I slip up and say Paul, I hope you'll forgive me for that. The writer of Hebrews, he sits down and he writes a treatise about why they should stay with Christianity. And he starts out with all these things that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Melchizedek. Jesus is better than Aaron. He offered up a better sacrifice. He inaugurated a better covenant. He's just better, 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 better. And after describing all of these things for about 10 and a half chapters, how Jesus is better, the writer kind of pivots about halfway through chapter 10. And he pivots to the point where it now is up to us to hold fast our confidence, hold fast our assurance, not forsaking the assembling of the saints. And he gets to the end of chapter 10, and he quotes Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. It opens up what we call chapter 11, he defines faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then he says something very interesting, that through it, through faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. Well, who were these individuals? Then he launches into what we would call the Hall of Fame of Faith. And he starts listing them off. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Rahab. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. By faith, Rahab. Then he kind of runs out of time. And he just lists Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah. David, Samuel. And he concludes chapter 10 the way, he, I'm sorry, he concludes chapter 11 the same way he started chapter 11. All these having obtained a good testimony through faith. Well, where's the writer going with this? What kind of application is he going to make for what he's done. Jesus is better. And he lists all of these guys and gals that we call the Hall of Fame of Faith. What's he going to do with it? He begins what we call Hebrews chapter 12 with these words. Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. It's interesting that the communion meditation this morning dealt with relationship. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Our relationship with Christ. I don't know about you, but this COVID-19 being cooped up in your home has about drove me nuts. I love my wife and I have a 10-year-old daughter. I'm 58 years old. We can talk about that later. But I have a 10-year-old daughter even when I'm 58. She's the greatest thing ever happened to me. You parents know what that's like. But I don't think I was designed to spend 168 hours a week with them. And all this being sequestered has caused some strain in our relationships. So what I want to talk to you this morning about is our relationship with Christ, which is the most important relationship you have. Now those three verses in Hebrews chapter 12 are interesting. Christ is presented in the scriptures as prophet, priest, and king. Those three verses speak to each one of those. Verse 1 speaks to our relationship to Christ as the King. As the King, He has expectations of us. Well, what are those expectations? The first expectation is He expects us to connect, to connect with all those old saints. I listed all those ones in Hebrews chapter 11. And remember, they all obtained a good testimony through faith. And then he begins chapter 12 with what he expects out of us. He says, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now that word witnesses is interesting. The word normally has the idea of testimony that you give to someone. That's the normal usage of the word. But here it has the idea of just being surrounded. 
And the vision, the, the idea, the mental picture is that we are, it's like a great audience out there that's sort of watching us in the race. And I know what people do with that verse. People get, they get derailed and they, can't, they lose the forest for the trees. They want to argue about, oh, what can the dead see? Can they see us? Can they not see us? That's not the point of the verse. The point of the verse is an encouragement. See, what God has always expected of His people is faithfulness. That has always been the defining characteristic of God's people. The just shall live by faith. And those saints in Hebrews chapter 11, they finished the race. They lived by faith. And they obtained a good testimony. And the King, King Jesus, what He expects us to do is connect with them and continue and be the same way. Having been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we also are expected to obtain a good testimony through faith by living faithfulness to King Jesus. So we're expected to comply with two things. First, lay aside. Well, lay aside what? Lay aside first every weight. Well, what's that talking about? When I think about that verse or that phrase, my mind races back to Matthew chapter 13 when Jesus gave the parable of the soils. And remember in that parable, he talked about thorny soil. And he talked about three things. The cares of this life, the desires for other things, and the deceitfulness of riches. Those are weights. The cares of this life. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I hope you won't hold it against me if it's bad. I'm not a big news consumer. It wasn't uncommon for me. Bill mentioned I preached down in Virginia. I preached at the Union Grove Christian Church for 11 years before I came up to the Christian Restoration Association. It really wasn't that uncommon for me to go to church on a Sunday morning and someone say, John, did you see this or did you see that? And I said, no, I really didn't see that. I'm not a big consumer of news. About three or four weeks ago, I realized not only was I consuming the news, I was consuming the news all the time watching this horse race called the virus. And I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm watching a horse race, but I don't know how long the track is. And it it was just, it was consuming me. The cares of this life. And we have to lay aside that. Lay aside the cares of this life. Now, I realize I needed a little bit better balance, so I've kind of had to figure out that balance. I don't mind confessing that to you. But we have to be careful. Because these cares of this life, the national and political concerns that are going around us, those can be weights. They're not right. They're not wrong. But we have to be careful and guard those that they don't consume us because that thorny soil will prevent us from running the race. The desire for other things. I don't know about you. I love football. And I'm telling you, if we get to the end of August and they're not playing football, I'm going to be upset. And I don't mind confessing that to you. But football's not my life, and I hope sports and things aren't your life. And those desire for other things. We have to lay those aside, and that word lay aside has the idea of taking off your coat, taking off your garment, and just setting it aside. Jesus expects us to comply with that, to lay aside every weight And, of course, the the deceitfulness of riches. I love the proverb which says, Do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease. Why? Because riches will make themselves wings and fly away. So be careful. Lay aside those weights. Lay aside the cares of this life. Lay aside the desire for other things. Lay aside the deceitfulness of riches. And lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares. In the context of the passage, the sin that he's probably talking about, I almost said Paul, the sin that he's talking about is unbelief in Jesus. Remember, that's the whole focus of the book. Losing sight of Jesus, losing sight of he's better, losing sight of faithfulness to him is what the Christian life is all about. But let's face it, even though, even if that's all he's talking about there is unbelief in Jesus, that'll cover a myriad of things 
Because as soon as you lose sight of the authority of Jesus, you'll be chasing all those other sins that we can list. So he expects us to comply with that. He expects us as the king to lay aside those weights and to lay aside the sin which, notice, so easily ensnares us. And the second thing he expects us to comply with is let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The Christian life is a race. Now that's not, I didn't make that up. Paul says so. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says that at the end of 2 Timothy. The Christian life is a race. Now I can relate to that. Think me weird if you want to. I don't mind. I've been called worse. I've run 10 marathons. When Paul says in there, see I just did it. When Paul says in there, let us run with endurance the race set before us, that idea of running has the idea of a long distance run. A long, committed, steady run. Not, he's not thinking about a short sprint. He's thinking about long distance run. I've run 10 marathons. I ran seven marathons by myself. And I said I wasn't going to run anymore. There's nothing magic about seven. I've been there, done that. I decided I wasn't going to do anymore. Real good preacher friend of mine always wanted to run a marathon. I would tell you his name, but I don't want to embarrass him. And so I said, okay, we'll do that. So we trained together and I escorted him to the finish line. Then my wife decided she wanted to run a marathon. So we trained and we ran the Richmond Marathon and we had so much fun, we did it about six months later in another marathon. So I've done seven marathons on my own. I've escorted people to the finish line three different times. I know what it's like to run endurance races, to keep running. And that's what the Lord expects us to do, to run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the king, he has expectations. Lay aside and run with endurance. Verse 2, I think about that as the priest. And as the priest, he sets the example. Remember, in the Old Testament, the priests were expected to set the example. They were expected to teach and show the people how to properly worship God. They failed over and over again. But the priest expects us, he, the, as the priest, he sets the example. But I don't know about you, but that verse 2 surprises me. Because it starts with these words. Looking unto Jesus. And that word looking has the idea of paying real close attention. Being intently focused. That what you want to see is undivided attention. Undivided attention. Now why do I say that surprises me? Because he just listed... 16 individuals in chapter 11, all of whom obtained a good testimony through faith. So it wouldn't surprise us to read, looking unto Noah, or looking unto Abraham, or looking unto Joseph, or looking unto David. That wouldn't surprise us. But no, despite how great all those individuals in chapter 11 were, and despite obtaining such great testimony, it's looking unto Jesus. Because He sets the example. He sets the example in what He's accomplished. Now, if you were listening close, I use the New King James Version. You can't tell that because it's worn off on the back. Bill, is your Bible like that? It's worn off like that. Thomas Nelson doesn't make any more like this. And I've said this before. If I ever lose this thing, I can't preach anymore. Because I'm like most preachers. I'll let you in on an inside secret. I'm like most preachers. I'm pretty sure the chapter and verses in the New Testament, I know a lot of chapter verses in the Old Testament, but here's what I know. That verse is in the right-hand column on the bottom, or that verse is on the left-hand column at the top. Isn't that right, Bill? I can find them because I know where they are. If I ever lose this thing, I'm done. What was I talking about? Anybody remember? Oh, I know. Do you notice how I quoted that verse to you? Looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Now, if you look in your translation, you probably have a word stuck in there between of and faith. So, is he the author and finisher of our faith? I like the New King James because words that are not in the original are in italics. 
The New King James sticks in the word our. Well, let's go with that. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Think about what he accomplished with his example. He's the author. He is the starter. One of the things that's developed in the book of Hebrews is all of those Old Testament sacrifices were not sufficient because it's not possible the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But when he came, what he started, he finished. Buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. So that Paul can say in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that I know whom I have believed. Paul didn't put his confidence in a what. Paul put his confidence in a whom. So he really is the author and finisher of our faith. What he started, he finished. And we by grace can partake of that. But look, it could be the author and finisher of the faith. Yes, all of those saints in the Old Testament that are mentioned there in chapter 11, they all obtained a good testimony, but most of them, we can go back there and point to their sins because all have sinned. There's a few like Enoch, we don't know what their sin was, but we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the Lord Jesus, He set the example in the faith. He also set the example in attitude. Who for joy I, that's not that hard to get over, isn't it? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. There, there are New Testament phrases. Have a look over to see at the clock. I don't know why your clock's not back there, Bill. We moved up to Mason. We attend the Loveland Christian Church. And our preacher was on vacation. So they asked me to speak. I'd never been on the platform and looked back. So I got up there, I looked back there, there's no clock. So after the service, I told the associate minister, I said, this is the only place I ever preached, I don't have a clock in the back. Showed up the next week, he'd got a digital clock back there. Big old huge numbers. So, so I apologize for looking off to the side. Didn't know what time it was. Some verses in the, old, in the New Testament, they're easy to understand Intellectually, I understand the words, but they're very difficult to grasp in reality. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That, that word combination doesn't make any sense to me. But here's what Jesus was able to do. He sets the example in attitude. See, he knew what was going to happen. You can't miss the, you read through the Gospels, you can't miss that he knew that he was on a journey to the cross. And when he started his earthly ministry, he knew he was on a three and a half year journey that was going to wind up on that cross. But see, he was able to look past that. He was able to look beyond Calvary. He was able to look past the sweating drops of blood. He was able to look past the grief and agony. He was able to look past the nails and the scars. He was able to look past that to what he was going to accomplish. See, that's what you and I have to do. Life is hard. I'm not in located in ministry anymore, but I used to tell the people I preach to, you come in here on Sunday morning, I won't beat you up. I'll preach through the scriptures. If I get to something that's a sin, I'll tell them it's sin. If we get to something that, you got, that the Lord's expecting you to do, I'll tell you He's expecting you to do it. But you come here me on Sunday morning, I won't beat you up. Because life is hard. The Christian life is hard. And you need encouragement. And what we have to learn to do is the financial struggles, the family struggles, the struggles with kids, the health struggles, this being not able to fellowship with one another. I don't know about you, I can't wait to start hugging people again. We have to learn to look beyond those to the other thing he set the example of, what he obtained, and has sat down at the right hand of God. See, his faithfulness, the, the God gave him a mission. Son, go down there. Live a sinless life. Die on a cross. 
What did he get out of that? The name that is above every name. That every knee will bow. And he has sat down at the right hand of God. And Paul says that he's ready for that crown of righteousness. And Revelation says, be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. He set the example. And in the struggles and challenges of life, whatever those happen to be, follow His example. Looking unto Jesus. Give your undivided attention to Him. Because I don't know what it's going to look like exactly. But I'll tell you this. On that great day, when He says, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And He presents to you that crown of life. Whatever you're going through now isn't going to seem that bad. He sets the example. As the king, He has expectations and we need to fulfill them. As the priest, He sets the example of how to live by faith. Look to Him. And as the prophet, he exhorts us. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now there, all the words in this verse start with a P. So there's a problem in that verse. And the problem is this, that you can become weary and discouraged in your soul. And what the writer of Hebrews is trying to do is he's trying to give us a formula to prevent that from happening. See, it's a reality that you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Verse 1 said to run with endurance the way set before you. And I mentioned marathoning. I'll tell you something interesting about marathoning, running 26.2 miles. <clears throat> the race is finished in the mind not in the legs. The race is finished in the mind. It's not finished in the legs. My wife and I ran the Richmond Marathon. <clears throat> I told her I was going to tell this story, so don't, don't, don't think bad of me. She gave me her permission. We ran the Richmond Marathon, and we had a plan. Can't run 26 miles without a plan. And we had a plan. We were going to walk at certain places, and we were going to walk through every water stop. When we got to the 21-mile water stop, we walked through that water stop, and our plan was to walk for a minute. So we walked for a minute through the water stop. And my wife goes, can we walk another minute? And I said, yeah, we can walk another minute. So we walked another minute. And then my wife said, my legs hurt. And I said, where? And she goes, everywhere from the hips down. I'll never forget that. And I told her, I said, dear, I may not have said that to her, but I said, dear, it hurts just as bad to walk as it does to run. Let's run. We'll finish faster. And off we went, and we finished. See, her legs could do it. It was her mind that needed to know it. Unless you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Notice, the writer's talking about being discouraged in your soul. The inner man. The old outer man, the old flesh gets beat up and worn out. And the old devil never stops attacking. But your mind has to stay engaged. Your mind has to stay focused. As Peter says, rest your hope fully upon the grace to be delivered. Keep your mind engaged. And he doesn't want you to become weary and discouraged. So what's the plan? The plan's very simple. Consider him. Very similar to looking unto Jesus. The idea is to sit down and think rationally about it. Sit down and have a rational thought about Jesus. Okay. Well, he endured hostility from sinners against himself. They perverted his teachings. They did everything they could do to thwart his plans. They ridiculed his claims. They accused him of being leagued with the devil. I mean, my goodness what he put up with. Remember what he said? If they do this to the green, <laughs> what are they going to do to the dry? Him who was the resurrection in life. Him who says, I am the life. 
to the source and sustainer of life, they ridiculed and perverted and mocked and said, you're of the devil. Well, it's not going to be any better for us. Consider him. So when you think you're getting a little weary, if you think you're getting a little discouraged, and you're thinking, man, this Christian life is hard, consider him. Sit down and just rationally think about what he did. He had a whole lot worse than us. And you'll find that inner man strength that Paul talks about. So here's some things to think about. Are you weary and heavy laden? Well, come to Him. Remember what He says? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We love that verse, don't we? But what's the next verse say? Take my yoke upon you. Well, yoke is done for work. But you know what I've noticed in observation in others' lives and my own too? When you team up with Jesus and just do what He wants you to do, the way He wants you to do it, when He wants you to do it, how He wants you to do it, life's not that tiring. Isn't that right? Life's not that tiring. We get tired when we're pushing back against Him. So if you're weary and heavy laden, just take the yoke, get back to business doing the way He would have you do it. Here's another thing, cast. Casting all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. I mentioned the cares of this life. Just give it to Him. And one of the challenges in the Christian life is casting it over there and leaving it over there. Isn't that what we do? We cast it upon Him at 6.30 in the morning. We pray about it. And at 8 o'clock we run over and give it back. Let me carry that all day. No, just cast your cares upon Him. He has big, broad shoulders. Let Him have it. Another thing I'll give you to do. Contemplate. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul's talking about being tired. And he gets down there and he says, our outer man is just wearing out. But the inner man is being renewed day by day. And he says, why is that, Paul? Why is that, Paul? Because the things of this earth are temporary. But the things of that life are eternal. And Paul says, I'm saying focused on the eternal things. Every once in a while, you just got to stop and think and contemplate the eternal things of God. And you'll find yourself getting recharged by being weary and discouraged in your soul. And I'll give you one more. Be confident. Be confident. The Lord never lied a single time. And He said He was going to prepare a place. And He would come back and take us where He is. He'll do that one day. So while you're considering Him, Think about that. Come to Him. Cast it on Him. Contemplate what is in store for us eternally. And be confident because one day He will. The relationship we have with Christ is the single most important relationship we have. As the King, He has expectations. So let's do it. Let's lay it aside. Let's run with endurance. As the priest, He sets the ultimate example. Let's follow in His footsteps, doing the way He wants us to do it. And as the prophet, he exhorts us. So think about him and do it his way. Let's pray. Almighty Father in heaven, I thank you for this time to be with the New Hope Christian Church this morning. I thank you for their fine work. I'm excited about their chances to expand and impact the community even greater ways for Christ. And I just lift up their congregation and the individuals to you this morning that you would just renew in a special way their relationship with Christ in their commitment to Him and their service to Him. I pray for Bill and the elders, Jim and the rest of the elders, that you would continue to strengthen and guide them. And Lord, that your hand of blessing would be upon this congregation in a powerful way. That as they serve this community, that more people could come to Christ and know the saving riches of the King of Kings. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, John, for that message this morning. We're going to be singing the song, I Am Thine, O Lord, which is draw me nearer, draw me nearer, the first and last verse. So if you're there at home, just open up your voice.
and uh, let it go. I am thine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. As we conclude our time of worship today, we're going to be singing the song, the family of God, and what a wonderful time we will have next Lord's Day as we get to see the family come back together here in our building, and so we look forward to that, the family of God. through from one to four this afternoon for our congregational vote on Andy Millis. You don't even have to get out of the car. Bring your own ink pen. We hope to see you here for that. And in the meantime, be in prayer and rejoice. Next week, we'll see each other. <laughs>